evening, everyone. I'm Alan Gold. I am uh, the lead portfolio manager of Papshire Private Equity Trust, and um, I'm delighted to be able to take you through that today. So, Patria Private Equity um, has been around a long time. So, it's been around since 2001, for over two decades, has been about providing access to some of the, the best that private equity can offer, principally in the mid-market and principally in Europe. Um, it's on the London Stock Exchange, the FTSE 250. And um, it um, um, basically um, has delivered over a long period of time. So the last 10 years uh, has an annualized NAV total return of 14.3%. And in fact, if you'd invested at the start in 2001, you'd experience a NAV total return on a cumulative basis of over 10 times. Um, so I'll go into detail how we invest in private equity, but it's principally through funds and also directly into private companies alongside um, our, our chosen private equity relationships. The trust pays a quarterly dividend. Um, it's a yield of around about 3% at the current share price. And the manager charges a flat fee here uh, of 95 bips, which is quite unusual in private equity, where usually um, managers charge a management fee and a performance fee on top. So this just illustrates how we invest. So what we're doing here is we're partnering with around between 10 and 15 core private equity relationships. In Europe, there are over 3,000 private equity firms you can choose from, globally 15,000. And we're, we're, we've got 14 core relationships right now that you can see on the left-hand side. And we invest via their funds, and this trust has has done this really since the start. It's made fund investments. It was originally a fund of fund. Um, but more recently, over the last five years, we've started making direct investments, which is at the bottom here, uh, bottom middle. Um, and that's directly investing into private companies alongside one of these lead private equity firms who are the majority owner of the business. And what we're doing is creating an underlying diversified portfolio of private companies well balanced by sector, and you can see the sector breakdown on the right hand side, but also by, by country, by maturity, uh, and by manager. Our largest manager exposure um, is around 13%. So just to delve into this strategy in a bit more detail, so I just referred to this, but, but this trust exists really to provide access to some of the best, um, the best firms and the best investments in private equity as well as providing daily liquidity, which isn't available in, in private equity normally, and is really only available via a listed investment trust. It is, as I said, a complex um, asset class with over 15,000 firms globally. And typically, if you want to invest in the normal way into a private equity fund, you have to make a commitment somewhere between 5 million and 20 million. Um, it's complex from a regulatory point of view. Uh, the liquidity, as I mentioned earlier, is uh, is often an issue for investors and the best managers the best funds the best of direct investments are often oversubscribed and closed to new investors so we help provide those opportunities to investors of all um, of all types and sizes so whilst the underlying portfolio is diversified we is a very much a conviction led approach so we've got our 14 core managers they're actually more than 60% now. They're, they're more like two thirds of the, the portfolio value with these 14 um, uh, managers. And, and being selective, being focused, we think leads to better outcomes. So on the right hand side, you can see our fund investments, our fund picks um, over the last 10 years, but over, uh, since inception as well, um, over 70% benchmark as top or second quartile. And in order to get the, the differentiated returns that private equity can provide vis-a-vis -vis listed equity, it's all about picking those, those top and, and second quartile performers. This trust is um, largely European, which is different to some of the other trusts that, that do a similar thing in this space um, that have a strong tilt to the US. 
Europe is really three quarters of what we do, and you can see the geographic exposure on this, this chart. Um, the United Kingdom and the Nordics are 15% uh, respectively, but we also like uh, regions like the Benelux, where private equity is well, um, well accepted, uh, with relatively stable macroeconomics, as well as some of the other larger economies in Europe, like France, like Germany. We have very little exposure to Southern Europe and Eastern Europe. We do have some exposure to the US and North America. Uh, well, North America equates to 24%. That's largely through European private equity managers that have successfully taken their model to the US, as well as some um, lower mid-market managers that, uh, that have a specific sector focus that we think is complementary with our, our European portfolio. And this slide brings to life the, the spectrum of private equity, so to speak. So on the left-hand side, you see venture capital. They're really from the early stage when, when perhaps the business is just forming. Um, it's just an idea at that point. Um, we, don't, we don't make investments into venture capital. We think that's a, a legitimate place to invest. But equally, it's sort of shoot for the moon. And if you miss, it's a write-off. You can still make great returns if you if you do actually get there, um, but it is volatile. And when you make direct investments in venture, you should be, you should be willing to, to lose capital from time to time. That's not really what we do here. And on the right-hand side, it's the large and mega cap space in private equity. So it's the names that you would know, the KKRs, the Blackstones, the, the large private markets asset managers. We've, we used to uh, participate in this part of the market but gradually we've done more and more in this mid-market, really in the middle of private equity. These are businesses between 100 million and a billion enterprise value at entry. They're established businesses, they're growing businesses, they're profitable businesses, and importantly, cash generative businesses. But they're businesses where there's still an opportunity to grow faster. It might be that they're undertaking a transition from the original founder, they need to build out a uh, a professionalized management team, or it might be that they're trying to internationalize the business or grow its scale through buy and build. It might be a software business that's looking to transition from license to the cloud. Businesses where they need to undertake a project, which is it's uh, where, where partnering with a private equity firm with experience um, can be value accretive, and also it's easier to do those sort of projects outside the glare of public markets. So we think from a risk return point of view, it's almost the best of both worlds. There's a lot of opportunity to create value, but these are businesses that are established and generating cash. And similar to Josh's, we've got a, a chart here showing um, the, the evolution um, of the NAV and the share price here. So you can see the NAV has grown for 14 consecutive years, as I mentioned earlier, over 10 times since inception. Uh, on an annualized basis over the last 10 years, 14.3%. Uh, um, it grows consistently over time. The share price bounces around a little bit, as, as it does with most private equity trusts. Um, we think that the current uh, share price discount to NAV provides an opportunity. The share price discount is around 29, 30%, which is wider than the, the long-term average and has only really been as wide as that at the start of the global pandemic and um, the GFC as well. So for those that are longer term minded, um, and I would say this, but I think it presents a, a, a fantastic opportunity um, from a buying perspective. A bit on the manager, because Patria is perhaps not as well known a name um, here as others, but we are basically the, the former Aberdeen private equity team. Um, we manage close to $12 billion of private equity AUM. Our senior team has on average over two decades experience investing in European private equity. And we've got 26 investment professionals and uh, we have relationships with over 300, investing relationship with over 300 private equity firms. And a bit about Patria very briefly. Um, so Patria acquired the manager in, um, well, it was signed in October last year and closed in April of this year. Patria have been around for over three decades. They used to be in partnership with Blackstone. They basically provide private, private markets 
um, in Latin America. But what they're trying to do now is grow outside of Latin America and provide European and North American private markets investment capabilities to Latin American investors, as well as Latin American investment opportunities to the rest of the world. Um, it's listed on the NASDAQ, it IPO'd in 2021, and has around 42 billion of AUM, of which um, our team is around a quarter of. And then you get the mug shots from our, our team. Um, the important thing to note here, this is a stable team. It's, uh, it's, uh, there's been no changes since Patria um, closed the transaction earlier this year, and there's no changes to investment strategy following Patria's acquisition as well. We won't start making investments into Latin American private equity. They're very much aligned with our focus on mid-market uh, as well. Briefly on performance, um, so for the first nine months of uh, 2024, our NAV total return increased by 3%. That was into a, a currency FX headwind with, the, the, with sterling appreciating versus dollar and euro. On a constant currency basis, our portfolio grew 8.7% in the nine months. But the share price has grown well over 21% during that period, aided by the NAV growth. But, but importantly, we, we began buying back shares. The board uh, announced that it would undertake a buyback program back in January of this year. So far, we've bought back in a, a one and a half million shares. That equates to around eight million pounds worth. Um, with the share price trading where it is, what better investment than buying your own your own portfolio at uh, at a discount? And that's uh, outperformance to the FTSE All Share Index um, of thirteen percent. Net assets are 1.2. Importantly, at the bottom, our expense ratio is 1.05. Because we have a flat fee, um, it, this stays relatively stable. And that's just reiterating this NAV growth here um, that you, we saw in that, that line chart earlier. But I would say that the right-hand side of the, the, the chart here, your immediate reaction might be that the growth is slowing down. In fact, our constant currency growth in the portfolio has been around 10, 11% for the last five years, if you pro forma 2024, of course. Um, but that, but FX with uh, sterling moving around versus the, the other two main um, currencies in the portfolio, dollar and euro, that's, uh, that's caused a lot of movement. But really, the, the portfolio growth is, has been pretty stable. Um, 2021 was an incredible year, a record year. Um, where there was a lot of activity in private equity and that helped drive that record performance. Um, but uh, but generally speaking, this trust grows somewhere between 8% and, and, and high teens uh, on a NAV total return basis um, every year. There's been a lot of talk about private equity activity slowing down over the last two years with a sharp rise in interest rates, but we're starting to see activity come back again. Um, on the left-hand side, you see some of the logos from companies that have had full exits during the last nine months. Importantly, um, Mademoiselle Dessert, which is a premium frozen pastry business and was our first direct investment, the first direct investment we made in 2019, um, that exited to a Swiss trade buyer for around two times original money, which we're really pleased with because it was a business that was quite impacted by, by COVID, given it supplies pastries to hotels, cafes, restaurants, as well as supermarkets. But an important thing to note here is that um, portfolio exits um, uh, realized that an average 23% valuation uplift compared to the valuation two quarters prior. So we, we've seen this for a long, long time in our book, in, our, in, in, in PPET's book and portfolio, that companies tend to exit uh, at an uplift compared to their unrealized valuation. So there's been a lot of talk about private equity valuations but the proof is in the pudding when a business is sold, on average, we see valuation uplifts. On the right-hand side, um, importantly, cash flows as well have um, reverted to net positive again. Last year, we saw investment drawdowns outpace investment distributions, but that's reversed so far this year. And that's just a, a sign of a private equity market that's beginning to warm up again. Uh, and we think there's reasons to believe that that, that uh, you know, that 
that market recovery will continue into 2025. On the portfolio, we've talked about the sector already, which is on the left-hand side. It's typically more stable sectors, uh, information technology, which is largely B2B software, mission-critical software, profitable software. Um, but also healthcare, 19%, consumer staples, 10%. Those three less cyclical sectors are over half of the book, and that that's, tends to be what we look for, um, sort of more resilient type businesses with recurring revenue and high cash flow that can support leverage. On the right hand side you can see the maturity of our underlying portfolio. Important things to pull out here is we don't try and time the market. We think private equity is a market that you need to stay invested in over the long term. Money tends, tends to flow into private equity at the wrong time at the height of the market when valuations are the highest uh, and then flow out straight away when a lot of the best opportunities are actually made because valuations have corrected. Uh, and we stay invested through the cycle to capture those, uh, those fantastic vintage years, as they're called. But importantly as well, around half of our book has been held for four years or more, and private equity tends to hold investments for between four and six years. So what that's, that, that, that leads you to de uh, deduce is that, um, that around half the book, uh, in theory, should be ripe for exit uh, and ripe to, ripe to generate cash flows in the near term. Just bringing to life our investment approach, so the top half of this very busy slide admittedly um, are the logos of the managers that we've backed in terms of their funds uh, by year, but the direct investments and, and secondary investments where we buy um, a position from another investor part of the way through the life of the investment they're held in uh, the bottom half of the slide here. And that's an important point to, to bring out. This trust is becoming more direct. At, uh, at, at 30th of June, 23% of the portfolio uh, was in direct investments across 30 private companies. That's increased since then to 25% of the portfolio and 32 uh, private companies. The beauty of direct investments is they typically don't attract any fees at an underlying level or performance fees. So they strip out that underlying layer of fees. So assuming that you build a high quality portfolio, they should be a tailwind to performance. That's the main benefit uh, versus funds, but also it gives us as a manager greater control over things like portfolio construction, the types of sectors we want additional exposure to, for example, um, but also cash management as well, because direct investments are funded up front, whereas funds are drawn over a long period of time. So we'll continue to grow the direct investment uh, portion of the book. Uh, we'd want to get that closer to 30% um, uh, over the, the short to medium term. Here's our top 10 companies. So Action, um, which many of you will recognize from 3i, is our largest exposure. We've held Action since 2011. We've taken money off the table from time to time, but that continues to perform very strongly indeed, um, as do most of these, in fact. The, the, a lot, most of them are performing ahead of an investment plan, and you can see the average top-line growth is just shy of 15% and the earnings growth of over 23% in the last 12 months. So strong performance in the top 10 companies, um, which equate to around 13.5% of portfolio value. But if we broaden that out to the top 50, um, you can see that that, that trend is, is replicated here as well. So it's not just cherry picking the top companies that are performing very well. When we broaden out to the top 50, which is just shy of 40% of portfolio value, we're seeing strong underlying growth there, um, as well as relatively low leverage as well, 3.9 times um, earnings. And the top 50 companies are well positioned from a, a, a capital structure point of view and a leverage point of view. Um, most have covenant light or loose debt packages. Um, most have uh, of, um, hedged interest rates. But importantly, on the right hand side, there's no maturity cliff in terms of debt. Um, only 14% of, of, of debt is is due over the next 18 months. And in terms of PPET's balance sheet, we're in a, a good position. 
Um, we've got over half of our 300 million revolving credit facility available to us, as well as cash on top of that, over 30 million of cash. And we do run an overcommitment strategy because we make fund investments, uh, but our outstanding commitments to funds uh, equate to around half of our portfolio value. And if you take away the, the liquid resources we have available that I just mentioned, our overcommitment ratio is around 35%, which is at the lower end of our, our long-term target range. So we feel very comfortable where the trust is. And importantly, what we've just done is sold a, a portfolio of um, of tail end assets, of, of, of uh, funds that were longer in the tooth, that were approaching non-core status, um, and we've just sold those on the secondary market in private, the private equity secondary market for around 95% of valuation, and that will bring in 180 million uh, of cash over the next um, 10 months or so. Lastly, dividend um, is now actually 14 consecutive years of annual dividend growth. Um, the board is committed to maintaining the value of the dividend in real terms, so in line with inflation. So the dividend grew 5% this year and 11% last year. Um, and uh, that, that's the position going forward on the dividend as well. So just conscious of time and leaving time for questions, um, but this trust is, is European focused, it's mid-market focused, it's becoming more direct, it has strong long-term performance, pays that quarterly dividend and a flat management fee, just to sum up. So maybe hand over to questions now. Okay, first question is about um, private companies in Europe. Um, read a lot about how in the UK and the US companies stay private for longer. Is that the same in Europe? Is the culture fairly different to, to what we see in those other markets? Whether companies are staying private for longer? Um, yeah, I mean, it's a general trend. I mean, it's been um, most pronounced in the US with some of those larger uh, names, the sort of Ubers and Airbnbs, those venture capital businesses that have um, have been backed over a long period of time and, and didn't need to list until they were, you know, 40, 50 billion dollars in enterprise value. But in Europe, we see similar trends as well. There's great businesses there. I, I would point to one in our portfolio uh, that's led by HG Capital called Visma, which had its latest funding round at around $19 billion, I believe. That's a business that maybe 20 years ago, um, it, it wouldn't have been able to do that in the private markets. It would have had to have list. So we're just seeing that general trend of companies staying private for longer, whether that's the US, UK or continental Europe. Next question about um, buybacks. You've described the, the being a buyback scheme in place. Is that ongoing or is that not finished? Yeah, that's ongoing. So um, we can buy back up to 30 million in value, 30 million sterling, and we're about 8 million into that. And it's it's opportunistic. It depends on the, the share price discount. Um, but uh, but yes, uh, we'll continue to buy back when when the opportunity arises. Next question is about the portfolio. Um, the percentage of the weightings to Southern Europe, I think it's Spain and Italy, 3 or 4%. Any particular reason or just not key on the companies there? Why are those percentages so low? Relatively? Yeah, we, I mean, um, I've covered the Iberian region personally for, for, for our team for a long time. What we find is the private equity managers are just, they're less mature than. Um, than, than Northwestern European or, or US managers, in fact, and then the returns can be somewhat volatile. Um, that's not to say there aren't good opportunities in the right spaces in Southern Europe, to particularly think the smaller end of the market in, uh, in, in that region is attractive because you can buy businesses that much cheaper, but we just prefer those more established markets um, in Europe, like the UK, the Nordics, Benelux, France, and to a lesser extent, Germany, um, where private equity is just that little bit more mature and returns are generally a bit more stable with a lower loss ratio. And final questions about the direct investments. Um, does that require a different skill set in the business? Um, and does it have any kind of capacity restraint? Are you able to keep on building that with the team that you have? 
Um, it, it's a great question because it does require a different skill set for sure. But we have our own direct investment team um, of eight individuals that that look at direct investment opportunities week in, week out, and have a long track record of successfully doing that. So we're fortunate in that regard. They can move quickly on opportunities, which allows us to differentiate ourselves and, and partner with managers in a much more constructive um, way. But it does require that, that different skill set. Probably the constraining factor isn't so much deal flow, I would say. I mean, we tend to see over 100 direct investment opportunities. Um, it's more um, the constraint is, if there is one, would be you do need to commit to funds in order to see the best direct investment opportunities alongside the best managers. I firmly believe in that. Uh, you don't get a free lunch um, in life, and so, uh, or rarely you do. And so um, you have to kind of provide that, that sort of, um, you have to commit to funds uh, in order to see the best deal flow, the highest quality deal flow. Um, so that's, it's not a constraining factor, but it's an important part, uh, important part of the whole equation. And funds as well, from a portfolio point of view, provide that diversification um, as well, um, as well as that strong direct investment uh, deal flow. Lovely. Um, I think we're out of time there. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you.